Okay. Well, let's say a prayer before we start tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Acts, for what we learned from it about what happened 2,000 years ago as uh, you're, uh, you're working in your prophecy program as you began the church uh, with the Apostle Paul. We, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the folks who desire to study this and to become workmen that need not to be ashamed. Uh, we thank you most of all for uh, the edification that we can provide one another and that you've taught us first. Amen. Okay, Acts chapter 1. This is our third lesson in the book. We covered the introduction. We covered uh, nine verses last week uh, for an hour and a half. A lot of material in Acts chapter 1. Um, trying to lay that foundation that the book of Acts is a bridge book. It is a transition book. It's a book that starts out with the kingdom gospel. And by the time it's done, Israel is fallen and the gospel is being sent to the Gentiles, and there's a church called the Body of Christ. So there's a big change that happens during this time period, uh, the first uh, 40 or 50 years there of the, uh, of, of the first century. So uh, it's important we understand what's happening. So last week we covered that commission that Jesus gave the 12 apostles in Acts 1, and how they needed to wait in Jerusalem and to receive the power from on high that the Father would send uh, as he had promised in John 14, 26, in John 15, Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit uh, after he left. So that we're at that point in time when he says to wait. This was part of the commission he told them in Luke 24 as well. Uh, a lot of people, when they talk about the Great Commission, they're quoting Matthew 28. And they take out a lot of the words and just kind of sum it down to go and preach, you know, go and teach the nation. That's really all they say. Matthew 28 actually goes on to say and teach them all the commandments and water baptize them. Mark 16, of course, adds all the signs that should follow. Luke 24 tells them, start in Jerusalem, wait in Jerusalem. And who does that? Uh, hardly anybody. But there's a reason for that. We covered that last week, and I promised to give you verses that I, uh, I could not remember on the top of my head last week. So if you turn to Isaiah 46, I want, I want to show these verses to you real quick. So I promised to give them to you. That the reason why Jesus told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem... And then he says that you'll be my witnesses, the 12 apostles will be their witness, his witnesses, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world, uh, was for a prophetic purpose. Remember last week we drew kind of the general map where we have Jerusalem, the city, the capital city where the temple was in Israel. Judea was that land mass of the two tribes, the two southern tribes in Israel. And then Samaria included the ten tribes, uh, which would be the rest of the nation of Israel. And then, of course, the uttermost parts of the world will be the Gentiles, right? And there's a reason why there's that order in Acts 1, verse 8. And the reason why is because, prophetically speaking, God had promised to Israel and to Jerusalem through Abram, Isaac, and Jacob that they would be a nation above the nations. It was only to Israel, only to Jerusalem, that Jesus said that you're a city on a hill. So Ronald Reagan was wrong. America is not. Jerusalem was, okay? That was a promise given to them specifically. And so Jerusalem was significant. In Isaiah 46, we see a prophecy here in verse uh, 13 that was one of the hundreds that mentioned this. It says, I bring near uh, my righteousness. It shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry. I will place salvation where? In Zion, for Israel, my glory. Okay? So Isaiah 46, 13, one of the many verses that say salvation is in Zion. Okay, Isaiah 65 would be another one. Isaiah 65, verse 19. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the verse of voice of crying. Isaiah 66, verse 13. As one whose mother comforts, so will I comfort you, and ye shall be comforted where? In Jerusalem. Okay. Isaiah 66, verse 20, it talks about all the nations, and it says, The nations shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations, upon horses and chariots, and in litters, and upon mules and swift beasts, to my holy mountain Jerusalem. So see, there's a prophetic significance to that geographical place. And so when Jesus says, you're my witnesses, uh, to, to witness me resurrected, and witness me as the King, and the, and the Messiah, and the Christ, starting in Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria, then the Gentiles. There's a prophetic order for that, okay? And that's exactly why uh, that, that Jesus said that. Look at Joel chapter 2 real quick. This will be important for later in today's lesson as well. In Joel chapter 2. Now, if you've read the book of Acts already, you know in Acts 2, Peter quotes these verses. But Joel 2 also mentions the importance of Jerusalem in the end times, in the latter days, when the Lord returns. These verses uh, have been quoted a lot lately in Christian news, 
uh, the church news as they talk about the events that are happening in this September, the circumstances of society, and they, they think those are signs of the fulfillment of prophecy. And of course, they, they, they really have to uh, put a question mark or leave out the, these things that deal with the centrality of Jerusalem because it's simply not happening that way. Um, but in Joel chapter 2, in verse uh, 32, that's what I want. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So notice here, don't miss it, that it's not just that God brings salvation to the world, which was his promise, okay, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, salvation would come to the world. It was salvation to the world through Israel. Salvation to the world in Jerusalem, right? So in Zechariah 8, the Gentiles, they grab the skirt of the Jews and they go to Jerusalem and go to Zion to find salvation. Deliverance is found in Zion and Jerusalem. You cannot say that today, okay? Jerusalem does not have the gospel being preached there. Now you can point out a handful of you know, Christians that are Jews are there, but it is not being preached from Jerusalem. That's not where people go to get saved. It would be a better chance of getting saved, plopping them down in some Western country, right? Um, and even at that, it's hard nowadays. But salvation being in Jerusalem was what the prophet spoke about. Okay, so that's so important. Turn back to Acts. It's so important then to realize that that's what the prophetic plan was. And that's also why, as I alluded to last week, and we'll cover in the future, why when Jerusalem rejected this message from the apostles in Acts chapter 7 and Acts chapter 8, the next thing the Lord did was changed what he was doing, and he called the Apostle Paul to go to the Gentiles to preach salvation. Because if Jerusalem is not on board, if salvation can't come to Jerusalem, it cannot fulfill the prophecies. The prophecies cannot be fulfilled. They've rejected it, you see. And so God is going to offer salvation because he's long-suffering, he's merciful, and he had purpose before the world began to dispense grace to the world. And so when they reject it, prophecy is postponed, and salvation begins to go to the rest of the world, okay? And we'll cover the order and how that happens uh, later in the book of Acts, okay? And so that's so important. Um, it's not that God can just set aside Israel and preach salvation and still fulfill prophecy. That's called a mystery, right? Prophecy was, was Jerusalem first, then the Gentiles. All right, the horse is beat dead. Um, let's go back to Acts 1, verse 6. Acts 1, 6. I also want to deal with this issue, which is a question that uh, Marcy wrote up last week at the end of our lesson. And I just wanted to deal with this real quick as well, just to make sure that we got... We understand what I was trying to say at the end of our lesson last week, and that we understand why Jesus responded this way to the, the apostles. Um, in verse 2, re, you recall, 1 and 2, uh, or verse 3 rather, Jesus taught the disciples for 40 days about the kingdom of God. And he opened their eyes in Luke 24 to understand the law and the prophets and the Psalms concerning Jesus, Jesus according to prophecy. So they had an understanding of these things. And so they were not ignorant of the nature of the kingdom and that sort of business. Uh, what they did not know was at what time Christ would restore the kingdom. They knew it would be restored. The question was, what time will it be? In Acts 1.6, that's exactly what they ask him. Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus does not respond with, uh, you dummies, the kingdom is spiritual, and it's inside of you, and this sort of thing. You're in the kingdom now. He doesn't say that at all. He doesn't say the kingdom has already come. Okay. Instead, he realizes that the kingdom to Israel has not yet been restored. Jesus knows that. He also knows not to say the time or the season, because it's not given for them to know. Acts 1, verse 7, he says to them, Is it not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power? And so they knew and expected a kingdom. The Lord did not correct them in that regard. It was just not for them to know. Turn back to Mark 13, verse 33. The question Marcy asked last week was, I thought it was for those in prophecy to understand the times. And I thought it was only for those in the mystery dispensation that the times did not matter because we're in the dispensation of grace. And she was talking about 1 Thessalonians 5, where Paul says, you have no need that I write unto you about the times and the seasons. Um, well, actually, uh, even though prophecy and the prophetic timeline was part of Israel's program and they could calculate signs and look at signs and, and know years and things like that according to Daniel's prophecy, there were times they did not know. It was not given for them to know. And Mark 13 points one of those out in verse 33. He says, Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. You see that Mark 13, 33? And so the issue here, what Jesus is teaching his disciples, is in this whole chapter, he's giving them signs, in Mark 13, signs of his coming. 
And he explains what the sign will be. And the, the, the sun will turn dark and the, there'll be signs you'll see over here and signs over there and avoid these things. Those aren't signs. And he's telling him prophetic signs. But he says in Mark 13, 33, that you know not when the time is. And he, in Matthew, he even says in Matthew that it's just like in the days of Noah, where he gave Noah prophecies and he told Noah to build an ark and to prepare, right, and to watch. And to, he gave him a warning of judgment. But people didn't know the time and when that flood would happen. It just came suddenly, right? And so it's the same thing Jesus is saying here. They did not know the time. In Mark 13, uh, 31, uh, you see this, you know, Mark 13, 24 up there at the top. In those days, after the tribulation, the sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light. Uh, in verse 25, the stars of heaven shall fall. The powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect and this sort of business. And of course, you have the parable of the fig tree in verse 28, where when you see the parable of the fig tree and it bears leaves, you know the summer is near, the time is near. And so he says down in verse 31, heaven and earth shall pass, but my words shall not pass away. Jesus is a prophet in this chapter, prophesying things that were not revealed this clearly in prophetic scriptures, giving them to the disciples about the prophetic timeline and what's going to happen at the time of his coming, the Son of Man's return. Okay. Uh, notice in Mark 13, 31, he says that my words shall not pass away. That is a statement of deity. Okay. It's going to be so important because you'll notice I just sandwiched verse 32 with those two verses, 33 and, 30, and 31. Uh, because in Mark 13, 32, so many people want to say that Jesus was ignorant of the mystery. Jesus did not know things, uh, and they want to diminish his deity. Okay, Mark 13, 32 says, Of that day and that hour knows no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Okay, well, Jesus is God. We know that from verse 31. Only God's words do not pass away. You can say whatever you want. Okay, you have no power, no authority to make everything you say come to pass. Only God does. And in Mark 13, 31, when Jesus says, here's these signs, here's what's going to happen, he says, heaven and earth can pass away, my words will not. Okay, the eternality of statements like that, that is, that is God, that, that he can say something and it will happen. Okay, that, that he, he says my words, he doesn't say God in this sense, he says my words. He's claiming to be and have that authority of God. So in verse 32, when he says of that day and that hour, that time, knows no man. This is true. There is no man that knows those things. Because man cannot know anything unless God tells him. Right? Man cannot know anything unless God tells him. God knows everything. God knows everything, and Jesus is God. And so he can say, my word shall not pass. Jesus, however, is also man. Well, I just got done saying, man does not know anything unless God tells him. Jesus was both God and man, you see. And so he was both. And so he, as the Son of Man, was not given. He did not know the time or the day or the hour. Did Jesus know as God? Most certainly. Okay. Jesus is God. He says, neither the Son, but the Father. He does not say in this verse, the Son doesn't know, but God knows. That would make him, in contrast to God, him not being God. But no, he says, neither the Son but the Father knows. Why does he say the Father? Because in the Trinity, there are three persons. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. John 10, 30 says, me and the Father are one. Jesus and the Father are one. They're both God. But they are different persons. And they have different roles and responsibilities in the Trinity. It was the role and responsibility of Jesus to become a man and suffer and die and raise from the dead to be the Savior. It was the role of the Spirit to be sent at Pentecost to fill these people, to help them witness with power of Jesus being the Christ. And it was given to the, it's the Father's purpose, it's the Father's power, one of his roles, to ordain the times, to be the one that says, it's time, go. Where does the Spirit come from in Acts chapter 1 verse I was at verse uh, 6 up there. Who sends the Spirit? The Father does, right? Who sent the Son? John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God sends the Son. You see, it's God the Father that has in his power the times. He's got the time clock. And he says it's time. 
Galatians 4, 4 says, when he was born of a woman, Jesus Christ was born of a woman at, the, at that right time. It was the time uh, of the Father. That's what it says in Galatians 4, 4. So the Father has in his hand the times. And so in Mark 13, 32, Jesus came to do a ministry to reveal to Israel the, the, the promises and to confirm the promises made to the fathers, to teach them about the kingdom and that he's the Messiah. Um, he gave them prophecies about what would happen in the future and said, my word shall not pass away. He, he declared himself to be God. And he says, but it's not, you don't know what the time it is. Okay. Look at verse 33. Once again, Mark 13, 33, it says, take ye heed. Who's he talking to? The disciples. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. He doesn't say, for we don't know when the time is. He says, for ye don't know when the time is. These disciples are supposed to watch and pray, knowing that the time is not in their knowledge. They're to minister without knowing that time. In Acts 1, verse 6, then, we know what Jesus is saying here. It's not that he's saying, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know the answer. Um, i got to ask the Father. It's simply that his, it wasn't his ministry, it wasn't his role and responsibility in Acts 1, verse 7, to tell them the times. He says it very clearly, it is not for you to know. He doesn't say, I don't know. He doesn't say that you cannot know. He says it's not for you to know. Okay, there's no reason for you to know. You need to minister without knowing that time. That's what they did in Mark, uh, in Mark 13, that's what they're supposed to do in Acts 1, not knowing that time. Okay, in the same way that today, that we minister without knowing the time. It's not for us to know. Some people don't like that when, when, I, when I say things like that because they say, think that God has given in his word a means to know times like that. And so they try to predict things like the rapture and stuff. But it's not for us to know. We're to minister not knowing the time, you see. Because we're to focus not on the time itself, but on the ministry we have to perform. It's the same thing with the, 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 the disciples here, the apostles. They have a ministry to perform to preach this kingdom, be filled with the Holy Ghost with power. So I just want to clarify that, that um, the, the Mark 13, 32 there is a statement, and Acts 1, verse 7 here is a statement simply that the Son is not the Father. It's a Trinitarian statement. It's not that Jesus isn't God. He is. It's him saying, I'm not the Father. Okay. Acts 1, verse 7 says, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. It's not in Jesus's it wasn't his responsibility to reveal all things that God knew, right? And the Father, Son, and the Spirit, and the Holy Council, uh, before the world began, determined what the purpose would be. And the, and the Father then reveals his plan. And the Son was part of the revelation. Okay, in Acts 1, verse 7, he says, The Father hath put in his own power the time. So it's not for you to know, all right? And so we just need to understand that. It's not that Jesus didn't know. It's that it wasn't for the disciples to know. All right. It wasn't for him to reveal as the Son of Man. Uh, meanwhile, moving on to the verses tonight, let's, let's pick up in verse uh, 9. We've covered verse 7, verse 8. When Jesus had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Uh, these three verses here speak about the historical, literal ascension of Jesus into heaven. A doctrine that is, is often neglected, I think, in the, the story of Jesus and his earthly ministry, his death and resurrection. Well, he, he also ascended to heaven. <laughs> no man has done this on his own either. Uh, he's, he is sitting, he was standing there, he's done talking. Normally you'd say, hey, you want to go back to Jerusalem and get some lunch? And he just, he takes off. And you go, well, okay, that's different. Um, and he ascends to heaven, okay? And we need to study this for, for a bit because there's a reason for this again. Uh, everything that happens in Jesus' ministry, I've said before, is to fulfill prophecy. There is nothing that Jesus did or said that did not fulfill prophecy. Luke 24 describes that. We have the books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just not as a collection of stories, but as a specific compilation of how Christ fulfilled prophecies so that we can know when we read those books and we read the prophets that that is the Christ, that's the Son of God. Okay? And it's no different in Acts 1 here. The things that he says and what he does when he ascends to heaven, it's required he ascend. If we don't have this passage that describes his ascension into heaven, and we wouldn't know it if it weren't for Acts chapter 1, if we don't have this passage here, then prophecy is not fulfilled. Prophecy is left unfulfilled. Not only that, but we would be asking, where's Jesus? Right? People would be asking, well, where is he? You say he rose from the dead, where is he? Right? Well, we know, of course, he's in heaven. Well, how did he get there? 
I mean, did he, his body change? Some people have taught in history that Jesus did not resurrect in a real physical body. It was some sort of a spirit thing. Well, that's just not true. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach that. It wasn't a real body that he rose in. Okay. But it, it, it was a real body. They, he ate things. He, people touched him. Okay. And he ascended in a body as a man, as God, to heaven. Okay. And there's a prophetic reason for this. Why did he go to heaven? We started asking this question last week when he promised to send the Spirit. In John 16, verse 7, he says that he has to go to heaven to send the Spirit. John 16, verse 6. So here's one reason. Uh, 16, verse 7, rather. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. John 16, verse 7. Jesus says, It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, that's the Spirit, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And that's important. Because that Comforter, that Holy Spirit, we didn't read the verse in Joel 2, but we'll see it in Acts chapter 2. Uh, that Spirit needed to come to fulfill prophecy. The prophecy said he'll pour out his Spirit on all flesh, and they'll prophesy and dream dreams and things like that. So the Spirit had to come according to the prophecy. The Spirit in Joel chapter 2 was actually a sign of the end times that the Holy Spirit would be poured out. That's why so many Pentecostals today try to claim that the rise of Pentecostal charismaticism itself is a sign of the end times. Because they'll go back and quote the prophecies and say, look at that, it says in the end he'll pour out his Spirit. And so they call it the latter rain. You've heard the latter rain talk and latter rain movement. That's the idea that in the prophecy, Jesus says there'll be the early and the latter rain. And they've been preaching latter rain since the 1900s, like 1904 and before. So that's, that's a long latter rain, folks, some hundred and some years already. But uh, that, that's what they say, and they get it in prophecy. The point being is that the Spirit's coming was a sign of the end times. So in John 16, 7, the Comforter will come only if I go, right? And, and why is that? Why is it one or the other? Some, uh, some Pentecostal denominations teach that's because the, uh, the Son and the Spirit are the same thing. And so they're called Unitarians or, or uh, the Oneness Pentecostals who, who preach that there's only one Jesus Christ and he just changed forms in the Spirit. It's like he took off the mask and put on a new mask and came down as the Spirit. Um, that's not true either. The Spirit is different than the Son. That the Son had to go to heaven, and the Spirit couldn't come until he went to heaven, because when Jesus went to heaven, he did something. He performed something when he went to heaven. And that there was something needed for him to perform in heaven that could not be done while he was still here on earth. And you read Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews 8. The book of Hebrews explains this. Hebrews explains how that all those laws about building an earthly tabernacle and about those things they offered in the tabernacle was just a figure of the things in heaven. Mind blown, right? What a revelation that those things that Jesus explains in the law was actually a picture of heavenly things. That, that'll open up those Levitical laws about you know, how many carpets they had to build for walls and how many poles there were part of the tabernacle. But in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, it says... Um, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. Talking here about the priests in the earthly tabernacle. They're a shadow of heavenly things. That's called a type. We covered what types were back in Genesis. A sh the types are shadows. Types are figures. Uh, types are things. Types are historical events and people and persons and things that God uses in the Bible to prophesy of other things. And what makes types unique in prophecy is that nobody knows when the type happens that it's a prophecy. Nobody knows. Typically, direct prophecies, a prophet will say, I'm speaking for the Lord, and you know that he's giving a prophecy. You just don't know if he's true until later when it happens. But in types, nobody knows it's a prophecy. The event is just recorded in the Bible. And then later, God tells another prophet to say, remember what happened back there in the Bible? Uh, that's recorded in the Bible because it was a prophecy. And what's amazing is those events that happen perfectly shadow or perfectly figure these things that happen in the future. Joseph, we saw what, 100 types in Joseph back in Genesis there, where the things that happened in his life that were recorded in the Bible was a type of Jesus. Same thing here, the tabernacle and the priest, it says, are a shadow of heavenly things. They didn't know that back then. God didn't say, I'm telling you these things so you know things about heaven. He just told them to do this. And then in Hebrews we learn, oh, uh, well, those are a type. That's a shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. And so he says, For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is a mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. The key word in the book of Hebrews is better. Better blood, better priesthood, better covenant. There's a better sacrifice, a better media, be better everything. 
Okay, there were things in the old, things are now better in all the new things given to Israel. Okay. Uh, verse 7 says, If that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second, which is why God made a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Okay, if you think the new covenant's for the church, then how does Israel get their blessings? Because that's what the old covenant was supposed to do for them. The new covenant was made with the house of Israel, house of Judah, which is what it says in this very chapter, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. Okay. Now, Hebrews 9, verse 24, um, I mentioned to you that Jesus had to do something when he went to heaven. He is the better mediator. He does have the better blood, the perfect sinless blood of God through his veins. Hebrews 9, 24 says, Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. Christ is a priest. Hebrews teaches that in Hebrews 7. He's a priest, not a Levitical priest, but a priest of the order of Melchizedek. And it says in Hebrews 9 that Christ did not enter into an earthly tabernacle. Christ never went into the Holy of Holies and offered anything in the Holy of Holies. Okay? But Hebrews 9, 24, Christ is entered into the holy place made w not with hands, which are the figures of the true, but in heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Who's the book of Hebrews written to? Hebrews. Who is the us? Hebrews. Right? Jesus went to heaven to go into a heavenly tabernacle to obtain salvation for Israel. Right? According to prophecy. That's why he had to go to heaven according to prophecy. Now, of course, we know that he goes to heaven not only according to prophecy, but to go to heaven to institute this new body of Christ. And he is the head who is in heaven. And we, he's given positions of authority and seats in heavenly places to us and part of the church. But none of that was known in the body of prophecy. What was known was tabernacles and sacrifices, and what could be known is that Christ went to heaven because he had to go up there to offer a sacrifice. No earthly temple could obtain a heavenly eternal sacrifice. So Hebrews 9 talks about that. Hebrews 9.25. Verse 6 and it says, for then, 926, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Um, I skipped verse 25. Verse 25 says, it's not that, uh, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place every year. So it's not that Jesus had to go to heaven multiple times and keep offering his, his blood up there like the priest did on earth. He went to holy of holies every year. Jesus went to heaven once to offer his blood once. And what happened after he offered his blood? He sat down on the right hand of the Father. And Hebrews makes a big deal about that, about how he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Because priests on earth never sit down. Their work's never done. They're always going back into the temple and offering sacrifices. But Jesus he went to heaven and he sat down because his work is done. All right? So Hebrews 9, verse 27 says, um, or verse 27, is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. This is an interesting verse for a couple reasons. Number one is it says that Christ will come twice. The first time he, he appeared uh, to bear the sins of many, that's the cross. The second time he'll come without sin unto salvation. So for Israel, they're looking for his return to bring salvation to the earth. He died for the sins here, took his blood to heaven, and he offered that in the heavenly temple. He's going to come back down with salvation to Israel, which is their kingdom. Okay? You, not being a part of Israel's covenants, have salvation offered to you freely right now. You can have salvation now. You could say, I am saved, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, because God offers it to you by his grace, not by a covenant, not by this sort of a, 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 a heavenly tabernacle work. Okay? Another thing that makes this verse interesting is that uh, some of the, the, the greatest and best manuscripts that they say in some other Bible translations that are used to translate their Bibles, the Vaticanus, a manuscript of the Bible, uh, they say one of the earliest complete manuscripts of the Bible that they use to translate some of the newer Bibles, uh, ends right here. There's no verse in that codex after Hebrews chapter 9, verse uh, 26, 27 here, which means it's missing, Hebrews 9, 28, that Christ was once offered to bear sins. Vaticanus text, a Catholic text, which I'm, I don't know if there's a connection, but the Catholics teach that he's offering it, his blood for sins over and over and over and again in their Mass, in their Roman Catholic Mass. That's what they do. They, trans, they transubstantiate, they think, the wine into his blood, and they offer his sacrifice again and again and again. And Hebrews 9, verse 28 says, no, he once offered his blood, once offered to bear the sins of many, once, just once. So that's another lesson for another day, but you can follow that word once in Hebrews to, to show 
there's no reason for a, for, for a perpetual, continual sacrifice. You did it one time, and that's it. All right. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. Hebrews 10, 11. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, <clears throat> after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Hebrews, 11, or Hebrews 10, verse 13. So he offered a sacrifice of his blood in the heavenly tabernacle for Israel. He sat down on the right hand of the Father. And it says in verse 13, waiting, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Have you heard that verse before? Okay, this is, this is quoted many times in the New Testament. It's a quote from Psalm 110. You may have it in your, in your cross-reference there. This verse, the writer of Hebrews didn't invent. This was Psalm 110 he's quoting here. But turn back to Psalm 110, and you'll see why this is important. This is the verse in the Old Testament that prophesies Jesus' ascension into heaven. His ascension. Not, not just his death was prophesied, not just his resurrection. His ascension was prophesied. It was essential not only to offer the blood for Israel, not only to send the Spirit, which was necessary to come as a sign of the end, but also because of this verse right here. Psalm 110, verse 1. David writes this psalm, and it says, The Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah God, said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. What an amazing verse. You say, how does that prophesy the ascension? Okay, well, this is why. First off, David is saying here about his Lord. And Jesus makes the point, um, this is talking about the Messiah, obviously. This is talking about the Lord of David, right? The, the promised one. God made a promise to David that his son, there'd be a king sitting on the throne of Israel from his house forever. The son of David was going to be the Messiah, the Christ, okay? So Psalm 110, when David calls him my Lord, you know, it's talking about the Christ here. Jesus raises a very good point in his earthly ministry, which is that if David's son was supposed to be the, the Messiah, the king, and David calls his son my Lord, then, then what does that mean? It means his son was not just a man, you see. That's what Jesus says, that they want to blame Jesus that he, he was declaring himself to be the Son of God, to be God. And Jesus says, why is it such a big deal? Your prophecies about your Messiah, about the Son of David, David himself calls the Christ his Lord, right? So which is greater, the Father or the Son? Well, if he's just a man, it'd be the Father, right? But the truth is, is the Messiah, the Christ, is not just a man. He is God, which means David, his Father, who was deserving of more honor than his Son, uh, says, this, my Son will be my Lord. Okay, but that's not, the, that's not the ascension part. I just thought I'd add that in for free. Um, the ascension part is when the, the Father, it says the Jehovah God, says unto this Messiah, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. This means that this coming son of David will have made enemies. Okay? Uh, if he had never come, what enemies does he have? Wouldn't every Jew want the Messiah to come? Even the Pharisees who nailed Jesus to the cross wanted the Messiah to come. Right? That's what the prophecy said. They just did not believe Jesus was him. Okay? But this prophecy here says that the Messiah will have enemies. And that's exactly what Jesus made in his earthly ministry. Enemies. And they crucified him. We'll see here in a bit the prophecies about that. But not only that, but you see here the one who came and made enemies, the son of David, this Messiah, is now sitting next to God's right hand. How did he get there? How did he get there? If he's got enemies, and we'll see later in prophecies, these enemies kill him, how did he get to sit next to the right hand? Well, he had to be resurrected, and he had to ascend to heaven. He had to go to heaven. That's where God's at up there. So he ascends up to heaven, and then it says, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And so there's going to be a time here where he's going to go to heaven until his enemies are conquered and he comes back, until it's time for him to return. Which goes back to what I was saying earlier, the Father sends him, right? The Father has the clock in his hand. Okay, so this verse here prophesies of the ascension. You can read more about that in uh, C.R. Stam's book. We have it on the back shelf, The Twofold Purpose of God, where he talks about the death, resurrection, and the ascension from prophecy and from the mystery perspective. And he talks about this verse in Psalm 110. He talks about the importance of this verse for prophecy of why Jesus had to ascend to heaven. Okay, why am I spending so much time on this? Just because people think that the book of Acts, in Acts 1 and 2, is the birthday of the church, the beginning of the church. Right? And I'm trying to show you from last week to this week that everything that's happening is a fulfillment of prophecy. It is not the beginning of some mystery thing or some new thing that was not known before. This is all, everything that the prophet said would happen. 
It's the fulfillment of things. It's not the beginning of something. It's the fulfillment of them. Okay? And so Psalm 110 there you need to have in your notes is a cross-reference to that. Let's go back to Acts chapter 1 and continue on what's going on here. So in Acts 1, we see there's a prophetic reason for the ascension, which is why this doctrine is so important that he actually was taken up to heaven um, in verse 9. Notice what it says about the details, though, that when he had spoken these things in verse 9, while they beheld, he was taken up. While they beheld. So they're watching him, right? This is very different than when Paul saw the Lord Jesus, for example. When Paul saw the Lord Jesus, well, how long was he looking at him? Oh, that's interesting. Someone appeared from heaven to me. You know. He wasn't looking at it. He was blinded because of the brightness of Jesus Christ, according to glory. Right? Jesus Christ in his glory blinded Saul. Right? These guys are going, there he goes. You know? And they're watching. They're beholding the whole time. They're seeing him, which tells you something about how he appears. Obviously, he's not so bright that he blinds them. Right? The apostles, the 12 apostles, only see Jesus as he was in, his, in, in the earth. Okay? Paul only ever saw Jesus in glory. There's a very big difference in how they both saw Jesus, which I think matches their apostleship. The 12 apostles ministered Jesus according to prophecy, according to the earth, and Paul ministers Christ according to heavenly glory. Amen. Right? There's a difference. And so we see in, in, in Acts 1 verse 9 here, the way they behold him, but also that a cloud received him out of their sight. And so it's interesting, the cloud there, it's not a clear blue sky, and Jesus is just flying up, you know, like, the, like you see some of the spacecraft, you see an airplane up there. There's clouds, apparently, which is interesting, because throughout the Bible, you often see clouds in association with God's presence. Um, your picture of Mount Sinai, uh, I don't know why and where I got this picture in my mind. My picture in my mind for a long time of Mount Sinai, when God gave the law, was a sunny day, and Moses walks up there, you know, and the God, they're up there with a picnic and getting the law. That's not what it was. It was a dark and stormy night, as Snoopy would say, right? But he went up to the mountain, there's dark clouds, there's lightning, there's thunders. I mean, it was, a, it was a scary day, okay? People on the ground were fearful because this God of judgment was giving these laws. Right? Uh, that was the day there. So clouds there associated with, with God. Uh, when they were delivered out of Egypt and they were walking through the wilderness, it was a cloud by day, right? That cloud by day represented God. So you have these clouds. Um, we also see later that Jesus, when he returns, he'll come in the clouds. You know the old verses to the hymn that would talk about the, the, the clouds being rolled back like a scroll, right? Jesus coming in the clouds. Right? Well, we'll see that's important here because that's what the angels say. But he, when he went up to heaven, he went up in a cloud that took him. So he went up in the clouds. So it may not have been they were standing up there, you know, for a good half hour waiting until he passed the stratosphere, you know. Uh, there's clouds. And so he goes up and they can't see. Now he's in the cloud. We don't know. Now we can't see him. Right, there's a cloud took him up. Verse 10 says, While they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Now, it doesn't say anything about angels in the sky. We don't know if they saw angels in the sky. Some people think that the cloud is actually a cloud of angels. We don't know. Okay, but we do know there are two men that stood by them. So here they are, looking up to heaven, and suddenly these strangers walk up going, huh, look at that guy, right? And these, these guys are angels, apparently. It says two men. Angels in your Bible are always identified as men. It's not a gender superiority. It's just that's the way they look. Never do you find in the Bible a, a female angel. But let's see here and there. In, in verse 10, it says two men stood by them in white apparel. So they're dressed in white clothes. The, the clothing of heaven, uh, of God's righteous apparel. And verse 11, they said to them, you men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Why? Why? This is also fascinating because didn't Paul tell us, on a spiritual level, of course, to set your affections on things above? Uh, Christ is in heaven. Your head is in heaven. You have heavenly places. Uh, we'll have a heavenly conversation in Philippians 3, verse 20. And so we're to set our affections on things up there. So our thoughts and our attentions are always on are going up there and are being there in, in, in heavenly things. That's what our mind's supposed to be set on. And Paul talks about us not being carnal, not being earthly. But these people who don't yet have the knowledge of the mystery of these heavenly things, don't understand, don't have the position of these things. They've been promised positions on the earth. They pray that kingdom come, that will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Right? And they see the Lord go up to heaven and they're standing up there looking at this and they're going, well, I wonder where he's going. I wonder what make him, makes him fly up there. You know, where's he going to sit? And the angels say, why are you standing there gazing up to heaven? He says, stop looking to heaven. So the angels tell them not to set their affections on those things, right? They've already been taught about the earthly kingdom. You have a job to do right here. He says, stop looking up there. That's not for you. That's, that's interesting. 
um, it was given to us, not to them, okay? Just taken up from you into heaven. Now they say the same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. That's a prophetic statement. As Jesus went up, he will come back. The same Jesus, right? Which tells you that this was not fulfilled in Acts chapter 9 when Jesus came back and appeared to the Apostle Paul. Because did he appear to the Apostle Paul in the same manner that they saw him here? No. Okay, he didn't. We've already covered the glory that blinded Saul, right? But these guys say he'll come, the same Jesus will come in the same manner, right? And this is very fascinating because that's exactly what we see in prophecy is that he will return in this way. And it's how we know that his return to Israel is different than his return to the church. This is not fulfilled in the, the rapture of the church. This is not a fulfillment of his return to the Apostle Paul. Jesus comes back and appears to people after Acts chapter 1. But it's not the fulfillment of this coming in Acts 1 verse 11. This is his, what they call in prophecy the second coming. But the, the, the number really is, is only relevant when you're talking about Jesus coming the first time. But he, he came, appeared multiple times to people. But in Acts chapter 1 verse 11, um, they'll see him coming, uh, come the same way. Well, well, how's that? Well, first of all, they saw him. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, every eye shall see. In fact, look at Revelation 1. Revelation 1 talks about this coming of the Lord, according to prophecy. In Revelation 1 verse 7 says, Behold, he comes with clouds. <laughs> Didn't Acts 1 say he went up and a cloud took him up there? Well, cloud's going to bring him back, Right? So I guess if you wanted to be quite literal on this, uh, he's not coming back on a clear day. <laughs> uh, if it is a clear day, clouds got to come first, right? So, but anyway, he says he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, just like every eye on the ground saw him leave, right? Now, will every eye see him when he appears? And in 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, we that are alive and that remain will be caught up in the air to be with the Lord. You know, we'll ever be with the Lord. Will every eye see him then? The answer would be no, right? Uh, this is not something that is publicly known where everybody sees him. But in Revelation 1 7, in Matthew 24, when he gives the sign, so it'll be like, it'll be like lightning. Everybody will see that I come. And it says, They also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. So Revelation 1 7 talks about how he's going to come. And it's the same way these angels say he's going to come. In the same manner he went up, he'll come. What's also interesting is. Uh, that it says in 2 Thessalonians and other places that he'll come in clouds with his angels, with his holy angels. And who's there standing next to these guys? Angels. Right? Also, where are they standing? So I don't know. Acts 1 verse uh, 12. They returned unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. That's where, they're That's where he went up, Olivet. Zechariah 14 4 says that the Messiah will come the day of the Lord. The Lord will come and stand on the Mount of Olives and it will cleave the east to the west and there'll be a mighty valley there. He'll come and stand down and break the mountain. Zechariah 14 verse 4. So he went up on Mount Olivet with angels in the clouds. Every eye is seeing him. He'll come back down. Every eye is seeing him in clouds with his angels and stand on Mount, Olive, Mount of Olives. And so, you see this as a, a connection of prophecy. Everything he does is to fulfill prophecies. Okay. Let's move on to verse 12. They returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. A Sabbath day's journey is simply, um, there was a law in Israel that you could not travel so far on the Sabbath day. So it's not that it took them a whole 24 hours to travel from the Mount of Olives to G Jerusalem. It was that you can only travel so far, and the Mount of Olives um, was... was about that far from Jerusalem, okay? Uh, about a mile, three quarters of a mile to a mile was all that you could travel on a Sabbath day without breaking the law. And so that's what it's talking about there. Um, they went back to Jerusalem, Luke 24, so they went back to Jerusalem with joy uh, because not only had they understood why Jesus had to die uh, according to prophecy, but they understood that he would come back in like manner. They had a commission. They were promised the Holy Spirit. They knew prophecies being fulfilled. They had a renewed hope, as Peter writes in 1 Peter 1 that now that he's risen from the dead, he's our king and he's still ministering with us. And Jesus said, I'll be with you always, right? So they have this joy going back to Jerusalem. And it says in verse 13, they were come in to Jerusalem. They went up into an upper room. You should remember that these men do not live in Jerusalem. Remember? They're Galileans. They, Galilee is not Jerusalem. Galilee's up here. And uh, they're down here in Jerusalem, Mount Olivet, the east side of 
Jerusalem. Okay? And so they go back to Jerusalem and they, they rent a hotel room. <laughs> that's what they're doing here. And, and that's important. So they don't go back home to Galilee with their families. Back to Jerusalem, because that's where Jesus said to go, and they rent a room. They're in an upper room. Okay? Um, they're up there, and it mentions here the 11 apostles, Peter, James, and John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, Simon, and Judas, the brother of James. These are 11. There's missing one, of course, and that'd be Judas the betrayer. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Whose brethren? Jesus's. <laughs> Jesus had brothers and sisters. The Roman Catholics are wrong uh, okay, about that. Um, this is the last time we hear about, we, we, we know about Mary, the mother of Jesus, being identified, particularly like this. Um, the Roman Catholics in 1951 declared infallibly from their papal authority, which was also self-declared, that Mary, just like Jesus, ascended up to heaven. There is no scriptural support for this whatsoever. The only ascension is Jesus. Mary never ascended. And here when it mentions there in the upper room, they're not bowing down praying to Mary. Mary's not giving them the scapular and this sort of thing, not forgiving their sins. She is there as part of the disciples, and she's not even one of the 12 apostles who are given 12 thrones to judge the 12 tribes of Israel, of whom Mary was a part. And so Mary blessed among women, blessed above women, right? Yes. And yet she's just part of the disciples here. And she's part of this kingdom group. Just one of, one of the many, all right? Um, Acts 1, verse 15. Mary was not given some special position to forgive your sins. All right. Um, where are we going with that? Let's look at Acts 1, verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. This is one of the many verses that indicate that Peter had an authoritative role among the 12 apostles. Uh, and oftentimes, the 12 apostles will, will say that Paul taught a different uh, gospel than Peter. Paul and Peter, right? Well, what we're saying there is we're talking about the 12 apostles. We're identifying Peter as just the, the head of them. And this is one of the places where we get that. Peter led these people. Peter is also the guy who stood up and preached the message in Acts 2. And so when we say Paul had a different gospel than Peter, we're saying Paul had a different gospel than Peter and, Math and Matthew and Bartholomew and Thomas, Andrew, Philip, James, John, Judas, Matthias, all these guys. And that's important because of the epistles written in the latter half of your Bible, you get James, Jude, John, right? Those are the same guys here in Acts chapter 1. Paul had a different gospel than them, right? So it's not just Paul and Peter, it's, it's Paul and the Twelve, you see. So that'll help you rightly divide, understanding the difference. But here Peter stands up in the midst of the disciples and says, the number of names together uh, uh, were about 120. So, so after all of Jesus' earthly ministry, um, there's 120 people in an upper room, including his, his family, his mom, right, his family. 120. There were, weren't there thousands that he fed? Weren't there thousands that he healed? Weren't there a multitude and here at the end of Jesus' ministry I mean the son of God comes to earth he performs a ministry and people today try to mimic his ministry pattern and at the end of his ministry of three and a half years how many does he have 120 that's it right? not a big group which uh, you know should confirm the fact uh, as it is throughout all scripture that it's always a minority <laughs> that that in the scripture God works through it's always a remnant, it seems like. God's always appealing to the world, and yet the majority of the world rejects him every time. There was eight people on that ark, okay? Uh, there was just one of the two sons of Adam and Eve that served God, you know, in the beginning, Cain and Abel. Uh, you had 12 apostles, only 120 in the upper room. And when Paul's ministry was over, he said, all those in Asia be turned away from me. You know, one of the biggest places that Paul ministered to, Asia, there in Ephesus and Colossus and Galatia, he says, they're all turned away from me. So Paul went to these places, and by the end of his ministry, he says, they're all gone. He says, only Luke was with me in 2 Timothy when he, in his travels. And so I don't say that to be discouraging or disappointing, but just simply that popularity doesn't determine truth, right? The majority doesn't determine truth. It's the Bible that does. Only 120 people here in the upper room. And then verse 16, it says, Men and brethren, this is what Peter says, This scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake. We've been saying that. We've been looking at prophecy all night, right? And Peter's now saying it, that this needed to happen to fulfill prophecy. This tells you it is not a mystery. <laughs> Kept secret since the world began. This is not the church here. This is the fulfillment of prophecy. He says, uh, it must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake. 
We need to pause here because that's a pretty good definition or a good example anyway of biblical inspiration. We talk about the Bible being inspired of God, as 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. What do we mean by that? We do not mean that that makes us feel good. And that just, that's good writing, you know, and man, it just speaks to my heart. That is not what the Bible means when it says inspired, insp inspired of God. Okay, inspiration is God uh, speaking through people and writing down his words on paper. That is what biblical inspiration is. And so you can't identify yourself as being inspired of God unless you're writing something down from God, his words on a page. Okay, so, so it's, this is not just, I felt inspired by seeing the sunset, or I read a good book and I was inspired, so I, I did something, or a preacher inspired me to, to do something. That, that's not the, the, the meaning of the word we're using here. Okay, meaning of the word here, divine inspiration of the Bible, is that God, these are God's words. These are the words God wanted us to have written down on paper. All right, and we know that from this example here because it says that the Holy Ghost spoke by the mouth of David. The whole book of the Psalms, is inspired by God, apparently. David wrote these psalms, and it says it's not David that was speaking those words. Who was speaking the words? The Holy Ghost. Isn't that strange? Because I thought David wrote those psalms. And you can go back there and read, and it sounds very personal to David and his circumstances in his life. I mean, he's writing these psalms. And yet it says right here, the Holy Ghost spake by the mouth of David. David was the instrument. The Holy Ghost used him to inspire Scripture, right? To speak prophecy. And so Peter says, that's what happened. Okay, inspiration is also mentioned in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. We've covered this, this doctrine before when we covered 2 Peter verse by verse. When Peter says that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 2 Peter 1, verse uh, 21. 20 and 21. No prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. That means it did not come from men. It came from God. Verse 21, the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Okay, the Bible was written by the Holy Ghost. Okay, uh, the Holy Ghost wrote, wrote these things. Uh, it's interesting, you only see three times in the Bible where God himself writes. You see uh, in Daniel, the writing on the wall, right? You see Jesus in his earthly ministry, writing in the sand, and you see the Holy Ghost writing, okay, this book, right? They spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So inspiration then is not something that um, we, it's not dispensational Bible study. When we study the Bible dispensationally, we say, well, we ask the question, what part of the scripture is to me for my participation? You know, which part of the scripture does God want me to obey directly? What are my instructions? What is God doing now? That's dispensational Bible study. Right? What is God's will for today? Inspiration, all the Bible is inspired. All of it is God-breathed. All of it is God-ordained. It's God-written. It's his words. Okay, but just because that God wrote the words doesn't mean they're for you to participate in. Does that make sense? Because when we tell people that we follow the pattern and instructions Christ gave to Paul in his epistles, a lot of times they'll say, well, don't you know all Scripture is inspired? 2 Timothy 3.16, you know, you're plucking out some, 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 uh, some books of the Bible. There's 66 books of the Bible. Yeah, they're all inspired, but they're not all written to me. And they're not all speaking to me. And the, I mean, like, literally, they're not spoken to me as the audience. And, and they're, they're not for my instruction, my participation, rather. Okay? And so one has nothing to do with the other. All of the, the Bible is inspired. We have to know who God was speaking to when he wrote it. Also, inspiration is not preservation, as we talk about the Bible translation issue. Inspiration is when God first inspired a scripture, wrote it down on a page. From that point on, preservation is required for us to have it today. There is not one copy of the original manuscript in existence that, in, that was originally inspired. And yet, in every statement of faith of churches, conservative fundamental churches, they'll say God inspired the Bible in the original writings, the original, the very first one. Right? I totally agree. But nobody has them anywhere. Without the doctrine of preservation, we have no trust in anything that we have God's word. We need preservation. The doctrine of it, that God has promised to do it and fulfills it, because we don't have those originals. We believe God inspired the originals, and then he preserved them for us to have. So we can say these are God's words, God's inspired words, preserved for us. 
right? So it's a different, a different doctrine. You should be aware of that as well. All of God's inspiration means that it's accurate. It means it's exactly what God wants us to say. Sometimes the devil speaks, but it's exactly what God wants us to know the devil said. So there's, there's no mistakes in God's inspired word. It doesn't mean when God inspired a word, uh, his word in the Bible that the men who wrote them understood the words. God gave words to prophets. They didn't know what they were talking about. That's inspiration, right? They didn't invent it. God gave them words to write down. They don't know what they were talking about. Just like in the types and the figures that we were talking about earlier, they wrote these things down in Genesis and did not know they were shadows. Okay? So it doesn't require understanding. Inspiration is God moving in men. Uh, inspiration is not revelation. Okay? Uh, there were things that God revealed and spoke to people. And there were words that Jesus uttered to Paul that Paul never wrote down. There were words that Jesus spoke to the disciples, things that he did that John never recorded. So inspiration and revelation are different. Okay? Inspiration is what God wrote down uh, as his words. Right? The inspiration of the Bible is also not exhaustive. People say, well, the Bible has all the answers. No, um, it has all the answers to the most important questions. <laughs> But you, you can't ask any old question and think the Bible's going to give you the answer, right? Well, it's the square root of, you know, 75. It's not in the Bible, you know. Uh, what do I have for dinner tonight? It's not in the Bible, right? It has the answers to the questions God wants you to ask, what you should be asking about life, right? So it has those answers. It's what God spoke through, man. It's what inspiration is. Turn to, um, keep your hand in Acts and turn to Psalm 49. We're going to have to stop here shortly. I know we're running close to the end, and I have a lot of prophecies to go through, so we'll probably cover some of this next week. Look at Psalm 49, or 41, rather, Psalm 41, verse 9. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1, verse 16, uh, we covered the tangent of inspiration, but Peter here is saying that what's going on and what has been going on is the fulfillment of prophecy which the Holy Ghost spoke by the mouth of David. And he's talking about the Psalms there. Okay? And it says, before concerning Judas. So Acts 1 verse 16, specifically the things that David wrote about Judas. Which is fascinating. We talk about prophecies of Jesus. Uh, perhaps you're not aware of prophecies of Judas. There are things that happen in Jesus' life and his ministry that he... He as a man, I'm not speaking about him being God, you know, and God controlling things, but him as a man could not control. And people say, well, anybody can fulfill prophecies. They'll just make sure they happen that way, right? They'll just say the things and do the things and go to the places that fulfilled. That's not true all, for all prophecies. Some of them maybe, okay? But others, you can't help where you're born, can you? I mean, did you choose that? No. Did you choose who your daddy's 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 daddy was? No. Um, there's things that you, you have no control over in the same thing with Jesus. You can't say, well, that's just a guy that, that went around fulfilling the prophecies on his own. He wasn't God, you know. He wasn't the Messiah. Because there are things that happen, like Judas, for example, that he had no control over. There was prophecies about Judas and what Judas would do in relation to the Messiah that Jesus didn't do. Right? Which shows you that Jesus was the Son of God. He was the Messiah, the one that David talked about. Psalm 41, 9 is, is one of those prophecies. Psalm 41, verse 9 says, um, Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat uh, of my bread, hath lift up his heel against me. But thou, O Lord, be merciful unto me, and raise me up, that I may requit them. Wow, that's interesting. So his familiar friend, the one that ate bread with him, raises his heel against him, and he prays that God raise him up. Now, you just reading that back in David's day wouldn't exactly know it's talking about Jesus. Right? David's talking in the context here about himself and his enemies. But then you see, as Jesus opens their eyes to the Psalms and the prophets that they spoke of him, you go back there and read Psalm 41, verse 9 and 10, you're going, wow, that's Judas in verse 9 who ate bread with him. And in verse 10, that's Jesus raising from the dead. Right? <laughs> wow. There's a messianic prophecy about Judas and Jesus, and Peter was talking about these things in Acts 1, verse 16. Okay? Um, it's getting late. I think we'll stop right there with a cliffhanger, unless you guys just want me to keep going. But uh, there's a lot of prophecies here we need to go through in Psalms, dealing with Judas and how he died um, and how he needs to be replaced. We'll deal with that next week. Okay? It's good stuff, interesting stuff. Any questions about what well, we covered four verses tonight?
lot of stuff. Yeah. I had a comment uh, about the discussion at the beginning of the lesson regarding Mark 13:32 yeah. and the times and the seasons and all this. And um, I, having having gone through a similar experience, I think I can I can maybe give an example that okay. would, would illustrate the concept well. And in in Israel's prophecy, they knew events that would happen and. Uh, clearly, Jesus was preaching that the kingdom was at hand, and that uh, they had the, the disciples had every indication that these things would be happening very soon, and they could tell that Jesus would be returning soon based on what Jesus said would happen, you know, before he came. Mm -hmm. And so there were things to be expected, uh, but they did not know exactly when it was going to happen. Sure. Uh, much the same way uh, that when your baby is due, <laughs> and you know that it's going to happen. Just I mean, don't know the exact day, right? It's showing you that it's going to happen. That's true. But you don't know when exactly. This is an excellent example. <laughs> and only you right now could think of this. <laughs> Any day now. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but this is true. To tie it in, a prophecy talks all the time. It, I mean, uses the example of the woman in travail. Yep. The woman in travail and all this sort yep. of thing. So, I mean, it, it's, act, it's a biblical example. No, I think, it, yeah, I think it's a perfect example. Yeah. And so, I mean, they knew. That, that, that it was imminent. They, they, they knew, they could tell from signs around them that it was going to be close. Jesus yeah. said, when these things happen, look for me coming next. And so yep. they, they had, they could tell when, generally speaking, they were in the right ballpark, but they could not know exactly when sure. that, that was going to happen exactly. Well, I'm going to keep going because you kept talking. Yes. Turn to Luke 21. Because I skipped the verse on the outline, but this is important to, based on what you said right there. You, you'd mentioned that there's things that they were going to see to happen, signs of, you know, before the baby's born, it's got to grow, it's got to, there's things that need to happen. Um, but then there comes a time when those things have been fulfilled and you just don't know it's any time now. Um, it's the same way with Israel, Luke 21. Jesus is telling them these events that need to happen first, but they don't know the, the, the actual time after the things happen. All they said is when they see these signs, they'll know that it's near. Right, and Luke twenty one deals with some of these things, and it used the word imminent, which I, I know you were talking about it being near. We're, we're going to contrast that this next Sunday, I think, or the coming Sundays. Uh, the difference between the return of Jesus according to prophecy, which though was near, was not imminent in the sense that there was nothing left to have need to have done. There are things that needed to have happen in prophecy before he came. Uh, in this dispensation, Jesus' return is imminent, and that there's nothing that needs to happen before he returns. He can come back at any time. There's nothing he's having before now and then. But Luke 21 in verse 27, I didn't quote this verse when talking about the clouds, and I should have, because Jesus says here um, in verse 27, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So they saw him go to heaven in a cloud. Here he says, you'll see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. There's a text with the cloud. But look in verse 28. When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. And so he tells them all these signs of Luke 21 that we didn't, we didn't read right now. And he says, here's the signs that'll happen, the abomination and desolation, and these things over here, and, th and these signs over here. Um, and then you'll see the Son of Man coming in cloud in great, in great glory. He says, when you see these signs, look up. Now, the, the apostles were looking up to heaven, and the angel said, what are you doing looking up? You know, don't look up. There are things that have to happen before he comes. So they couldn't just stand around there looking up to heaven and just waiting. They had to go to Jerusalem. Jesus himself said the spirit has to come first. There's got to be signs that happen first. So there was a time that had to be fulfilled. And there was a certain time here, Jesus says, when you see these things, then look up. Because that's when, you know, there's a certain time you get ready for the baby to get born. You know, nine months ago, yeah, you know, nine months down the road, there's things that had to happen first. Uh, but now you're, you're looking for it. Same thing then. Jesus says there's things going to happen. There's distress and these sort of things. And then you look into heaven. Uh, look at his return. So yeah, I, th I think it's a perfect example of it. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, but yeah, that is the difference between his coming for them, of them not knowing the exact time, but knowing signs. Us, we have no signs. The time in which Jesus comes for the church, according to mystery, there's no prophecy that needs to be fulfilled. We are simply his ambassadors, preaching a message, doing a responsibility, and when he's done dispensing grace, he's going to let us know. Right, which, which is, we'll cover it on, on Sundays in the next couple of weeks, which is why we believe in a rapture at all. I know the rapture is not a Bible word, but that's why you believe in it. Um, the rapture it, coming of the Lord, the Lord coming for the church, uh, was talked about and taught only by dispensationalists who understood Israel and the church were different, and that we're living in a mystery dispensation, not a prophecy. 
Because if we're living in the prophecy dispensation, then there are things that have to happen before he comes. Which means there's no rapture. We're looking to go through the tribulation. We're looking for his coming to the earth and everything else. So that, that's a preview of Sunday. But thank, thank you for mentioning that excellent example. Um, I thought you were going to go back to Mark 13, 32. I, I, keep, I keep mentioning Mark, Mark 13 and, and about Jesus not knowing or not knowing just because it is a, um, an issue that, unfortunately, grace pastors keep bringing up about Jesus being ignorant and not knowing things, uh, all things, and him only knowing things he studies from the Bible and things like that. And that's just, simply not true. Je Jesus is a man, and he's also God. So in his man, he is, his, his, his human soul, his human brain had to acquire synapses and, and neural connections. So he had to learn in his humanity, but Jesus is also God, which means God never learns anything. God knows everything. And so he is both, you understand. It's not that he stopped being God and he had to depend on the Father. No, he was God the Son. And so at any time, God the Son and God the Son of Man, you know, Jesus Christ the Son of Man, they're one person, you know. Um, so he, he knows all things, and he was everywhere, and yet he was in a mother's womb, you know. He... He, he knows all things, and yet he had to learn how to, you know, eat with, I don't know, they have sporks back then? I don't know. So, you have that. He, he had to learn how to walk, right? I mean, he, and yet he was God. He had to learn how to walk. So, you, you, can't, you can't deny one or the other. So, be careful that there's some folks who are trying to, to put you, make Christ your pattern in that way. Well, he's like you and how you have to learn and have to trust God. Nobody is like the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a man like you, in the flesh like you, but without sin, and he was God, and you are not God. No man knows Jesus wasn't only a man. He was a man, but he wasn't only a man. You can't claim that. You can't say, I'm not only a man. No, you're only a man. So, anyway, another topic. That's been my pet doctrine lately. Any, any other questions? All right. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your word and prophecy that we studied again tonight, uh, proving that uh, you did come to visit this planet and you did die for our sins and that our faith is certain. Um, as Peter says, even though we don't see some of these things, we have a more sure word of prophecy. So we thank you that you inspired the Bible for us, preserved it for us so that we can be confident in its words and its doctrines and our salvation. Amen. Thank you, folks.